Section 12 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 12. The Shields Duel. An incident which occurred during the summer preceding Mr. Lincoln's marriage, and which in the opinion of many had its influence in hastening that event, deserves some attention, if only from its incongruity with the rest of his history. This was the farce, which aspired at one time to be a tragedy, of his first and last duel. Among the officers of the state government was a young Irishman named James Shields, who owed his post as auditor in great measure to that alien vote to gain which the Democrats had overturned the Supreme Court. The finances of the state were in a deplorable condition. The treasury was empty. Auditors' warrants were selling at half their nominal value. No more money was to be borrowed, and taxation was dreaded by both political parties more than disgrace. The currency of the state banks was well-nigh worthless but it constituted nearly the only circulating medium in the state. In the middle of August, the governor, auditor, and treasurer issued a circular forbidding the payment of state taxes in this depreciated paper. This order was naturally taken by the Whigs as indicating on the part of these officers a keener interest in the integrity of their salaries than in the public welfare, and it was therefore severely attacked in all the opposition newspapers of the state. The sharpest assault it had to endure, however, was in a communication dated August 27 and printed in the Sangamo Journal of September 2nd, not only dissecting the administration circular with the most savage satire, but covering the auditor with merciless personal ridicule. It was written in the dialect of the country, dated from the Lost Townships, and signed Rebecca, and purported to come from a farmer widow of the county, who expressed in this fashion her discontent with the evil course of affairs. Shields was a man of inordinate vanity and a corresponding irascibility. He was, for that reason, an irresistible mark for satire. Through a long life of somewhat conspicuous public service, he never lost a certain tone of absurdity, which can only be accounted for by the qualities we have mentioned. Even his honorable wounds in battle while they were productive of great public applause and political success, gained him scarcely less ridicule than praise. He never could refrain from talking of them himself, having none of Coriolanus's repugnance in that respect, and for that reason was a constant target for newspaper wits. After Shields returned from the Mexican War with his laurels still green, and at the close of the canvas which had made him senator, he wrote an incredible letter to Judge Brees, his principal competitor, in which he committed the gratuitous folly of informing him that, quote, he had sworn in his heart, if Brees had been elected, that he should never have profited by his success and depend upon it, unquote. He added, in the amazing impudence of triumph, quote, I would have kept that vow regardless of consequences, that, however, is now passed, and the vow is cancelled by your defeat. Unquote. He then went on, with threats equally indecent, to make certain demands which were altogether inadmissible, and which Judge Brees only noticed by sending this preposterous letter to the press. It may easily be imagined that a man who, after being elected a senator of the United States, was capable of the insane insolence of signing his name to a letter informing his defeated competitor that he would have killed him if the result had been different, would not have been likely, when seven years younger, to bear newspaper ridicule with equanimity. His fury against the unknown author of the satire was the subject of much merriment in Springfield, and the next week another letter appeared, from a different hand, but adopting the machinery of the first, in which the widow offered to make up the quarrel by marrying the auditor, and this in time was followed by an epithalamium in which this happy compromise was celebrated in very bad verses. In the change of hands all the humor of the thing had evaporated, and nothing was left but feminine mischief on one side, and the exasperation of wounded vanity on the other. 
Shields, however, had talked so much about the matter that he now felt imperatively called upon to act, and he therefore sent General Whitesides to demand from the journal the name of its contributor. Mr. Francis, the editor, was in a quandary. Lincoln had written the first letter, and the antic fury of Shields had induced two young ladies who took a lively interest in Illinois politics, and with good reason, for one was to be the wife of a senator and the other of a president, to follow up the game with attacks in prose and verse which, however deficient in wit and meter, were not wanting in pungency. In his dilemma he applied to Lincoln, who, as he was starting to attend court at Tremont, told him to give his name and withhold the names of the ladies. As soon as Whitesides received this information, he and his fiery principal set out for Tremont, and as Shields did nothing in silence, the news came to Lincoln's friends, two of whom, William Butler and Dr. Merriman, one of those combative medical men who have almost disappeared from American society, went off in a buggy in pursuit. They soon came in sight of the others, but loitered in the rear until evening, and then drove rapidly to Tremont, arriving there some time in advance of Shields, so that in the ensuing negotiations Abraham Lincoln had the assistance of friends whose fidelity and whose nerve were equally beyond question. It would be useless to recount all the tedious preliminaries of the affair. Shields opened the correspondence, as might have been expected, with blustering and with threats. His nature had no other way of expressing itself. His first letter was taken as a bar to any explanation or understanding, and he afterwards wrote a second, a little less offensive in tone, but without withdrawing the first. At every interview of the seconds, General Whitesides deplored the bloodthirsty disposition of his principal, and urged that Mr. Lincoln should make the concessions which alone would prevent lamentable results. These representations seemed to avail nothing, however, and the parties, after endless talk, went to Alton and crossed the river to the Missouri shore. It seemed for a moment that the fight must take place. The terms had been left by the code, as then understood in the West, to Lincoln, and he certainly made no grudging use of his privilege. The weapons chosen were cavalry broadswords of the largest size, and the combatants were to stand on either side of a board placed on the ground, each to fight in a limit of six feet on his own side of the board. It was evident that Lincoln did not desire the death of his adversary, and did not intend to be materially injured himself. The advantage, morally, was altogether against him. He felt intensely the stupidity of the whole affair, but thought he could not avoid the fight without degradation, while to Shields such a fracas was a delight. The duel came to its natural end by the intervention of the usual gods out of a machine, the gods being John J. Hardin and one Dr. English, and the machine a canoe in which they had hastily paddled across the Mississippi. Shields suffered himself to be persuaded to withdraw his offensive challenge. Lincoln then made the explanation he had been ready to make from the beginning, avowing the one letter he had written, and saying that it had been printed solely for political effect, and without any intention of injuring Shields personally. One would think that, after a week passed in such unprofitable trifling, the parties, uh, principal and secondary, would have been willing to drop the matter forever. We are sure that Lincoln would have been glad to banish it, even from his memory. But to men like Shields and Whitesides, the peculiar relish and enjoyment of such an affair is its publicity. On the 3rd of October, therefore, eleven days after the meeting, as public attention seemed to be flagging, Whitesides wrote an account of it to the Sangamo Journal, for which he did not forget to say, quote, I hold myself responsible. Of course, he seized the occasion to paint a heroic portrait of himself and his principal. It was an excellent story until the next week when Dr. Merriman, who seems to have wielded a pen like a scalpel, gave a much fuller history of the matter, which he substantiated by printing all the documents, and not content with that gave little details of the negotiations which show either that Whitesides was one of the most grotesque braggarts of the time, or that Merriman was an admirable writer of comic fiction. Among the most amusing facts he brought forward was that Whitesides, being a fund commissioner of the state, ran the risk of losing his office by engaging in a duel. 
and his anxiety to appear reckless and dangerous, and yet keep within the statute and save his salary, was depicted by Merriman with a droll fidelity. He concluded by charging Whitesides plainly with, quote, inefficiency and want of knowledge of those laws which govern gentlemen in matters of this kind, unquote, and with, quote, trying to wipe out his fault by doing an act of injustice to Mr. Lincoln, unquote. The town was greatly diverted by these pungent echoes of the bloodless fight, and Shields and Whitesides felt that their honor was still out of repair, a rapid series of challenges succeeded among the parties, principals and seconds changing places as deftly as dancers in a quadrille. The auditor challenged Mr. Butler, who had been very outspoken in his contemptuous comments on the affair. Butler at once accepted, and with a grim sincerity announced his conditions. Quote, to fight next morning at sunrising in Bob Allen's meadow, one hundred yards distant, with rifles. Unquote. This was instantly declined, with a sort of horror, by Shields and Whitesides, as such a proceeding would have proved fatal to their official positions and their means of livelihood. They probably cared less for the chances of harm from Butler's Kentucky rifle than for the certainty of the Illinois law which cut off all duelists from holding office in the state. But on the other hand, so unreasonable is human nature as displayed among politicians, General Whitesides felt that if he bore patiently the winged words of Merriman, his availability as a candidate was greatly damaged, and he therefore sent to the witty doctor what Mr. Lincoln called a quasi-challenge, hurling at him a modified defiance, which should be enough to lure him to the field of honor, and yet not sufficiently explicit to lose Whitesides the dignity and perquisites of fund commissioner. Merriman, not being an office holder and having no salary to risk, responded with brutal directness, which was highly unsatisfactory to Whitesides, who was determined not to fight unless he could do so lawfully, and Lincoln, who now acted as second to the doctor in his turn, records the cessation of the correspondence amid the agonized explanations of Whitesides and the scornful hootings of Merriman. Quote, while the town was in a ferment and a street fight somewhat anticipated, unquote. In respect to the last diversion, the town was disappointed. Shields lost nothing by the hilarity which this burlesque incident created. He was reserved for a career of singular luck and glory mingled with signal misfortunes. On account of his political availability, he continued throughout a long lifetime to be selected at intervals for high positions. After he ceased to be auditor, he was elected judge of the Supreme Court of Illinois. While still holding that position, he applied for the place of commissioner of the General Land Office, and his application was successful. When the Mexican War broke out, he asked for a commission as brigadier general, although he still held his civil appointment, and, to the amazement of the whole army, he was given that important command before he had ever seen a day's service. At the Battle of Cerro Gordo, he was shot through the lungs, and this wound made him a United States senator as soon as he returned from the war. After he had served one term in the Senate, he removed from Illinois and was soon sent back to the same body from Minnesota. In the War of the Rebellion, he was again appointed a brigadier general by his old adversary and was again wounded in a battle in which his troops defeated the redoubtable Stonewall Jackson and many years after Lincoln was laid to sleep beneath the mountain of marble in Springfield, Shields was made the shuttlecock of contending demagogues in Congress, each striving to make a point by voting him money, until in the impulse of that transient controversy, the state of Missouri, finding the gray-headed soldier in her borders, for the third time sent him to the Senate of the United States for a few weeks, a history unparalleled, even in America. We have reason to think that the affair of the duel was excessively distasteful to Lincoln. He did not even enjoy the ludicrousness of it, as might have been expected. He, he never, so far as we can learn, alluded to it afterwards, and the recollection of it died away so completely from the minds of people in the state that during the heated canvass of 1860 there was no mention of this disagreeable episode in the opposition papers of Illinois. It had been absolutely forgotten. 
This was Mr. Lincoln's last personal quarrel. Although the rest of his life was passed in hot and earnest debate, he never again descended to the level of his adversaries, who would gladly enough have resorted to unseemly wrangling. In later years it became his duty to give an official reprimand to a young officer who had been court-martialed for a quarrel with one of his associates. The reprimand is probably the gentlest recorded in the annals of penal discourses, and it shows in few words the principles which ruled the conduct of this great and peaceable man. It has never before been published, and it deserves to be written in letters of gold on the walls of every gymnasium and college. The Advice of a Father to His Son Quote, Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may be beware of thee, Unquote, is good, but not the best. Quarrel not at all. No man resolved to make the most of himself can spare time for personal contention. Still less can he afford to take all the consequences, including the vitiating of his temper and the loss of self-control. Yield larger things to which you can show no more than equal right, and yield lesser ones, though clearly your own. Better give your path to a dog than be bitten by him in contesting for the right. Even killing the dog would not cure the bite. Footnote Lincoln's life was unusually free from personal disputes. We know of only one other hostile letter addressed to him. This was from W. G. Anderson, who, being worsted in a verbal encounter with Lincoln at Lawrenceville, the county seat of Lawrence County, Illinois, wrote him a note demanding an explanation of his words and of his present feelings. Lincoln's reply shows that his habitual peaceableness involved no lack of dignity. He said, quote, Your note of yesterday is received. In the difficulty between us of which you speak, you say you think I was the aggressor. I do not think I was. You say my words imported insult. I meant them as a fair set-off to your own statements, and not otherwise. And in that light alone I now wish you to understand them. You ask for my present feelings on the subject. I entertain no unkind feeling to you, and none of any sort upon the subject, except a sincere regret that I permitted myself to get into any such altercation. End of quote. This seems to have ended the matter, although the apology was made rather to himself than to Mr. Anderson. See the letter of William C. Wilkinson in the Century Magazine for January 1889. End of section 12.